Good morning and welcome to St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church in Stittsville for this Sunday morning, Sunday, October 18th, 2020. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. A warm welcome to anyone who's joining us for the first time this Sunday for our online worship service. And if you would like to join us for coffee hour, uh, just send an email to the church and we do a Zoom coffee hour uh, at 11 a.m. on Sunday mornings and you'd be more than welcome to join us. Let's join together in our worship. The call to worship will be done by Katie. God created all that is, what is seen and what is unseen. God also knows each of us by name. God causes galaxies to come into being. God also knows the deepest fears and anxieties and longings of our individual hearts. God is holy, other, and unknowable. And yet God chose to create us, male and female, in his image. We will never understand God's ways, and yet we will gather together to worship and offer God our praise. Let us worship God together. Let's join together in our opening hymn, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise, number 290. Let's come before God in prayer. Let us pray. God of grace and beauty and power, you created our minds to know you better. You formed our hearts to love you. You crafted our voices to speak and sing your praise. You made our very beings to be giving people. Fill us with your Holy Spirit so that we may celebrate your glory and worship you in spirit and in truth. Together we are the body of Christ, and each one of us has the responsibility, the desire to respond to you in word and deed and with our love. Yet while you are beside us and within us, above us, all around us, we still manage to ignore you. We are satisfied to receive the gifts, but when it comes to passing on your abundance, we hesitate. We are happy to say a prayer to you, but we spend less time waiting and listening for you to speak to us. Help us to be your people, as you are our God. We ask this in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Hear the good news of the gospel that is shared with us over and over again. Though sometimes we grow weary, we also take heart. Our God remains near to us. God forgives us. God cares for us and gives us strength to go on for the new day and the new week. Thanks be to God for God's grace and God's mercy. Amen. Our choir is now going to share with us a ministry of music. Let's join together for our children's time. First of all, we have a wonderful celebration to share this morning, um, and that is a celebration for Peter and Donna's uh, 30th wedding anniversary that's happening this week. So congratulations to Peter and Donna. We celebrate with you as your church family and uh, cousin Vicky is in this as well. So we share a celebration with you. But before I put the money in, I'm going to use it for the children's story as well. And I've got some other coins here too. 
You've ever noticed when you look at money that it has a picture on it, a picture of a person. That's true with our bills. That's true with our coins as well. This one's a nickel. This one is a dime. And some of you may remember what this is too. This is a penny. We used to use pennies as well. And all of these have a picture of the queen on them. And when I was looking at that picture of the queen, it reminded me, and before I do anything else, I'm gonna put this in, uh, in celebration of Peter and Donna's 30th wedding anniversary. When I was looking at those uh, images of the queen on our money, it reminded me of the story that Jesus told uh, in his day. He had some people come to him and tried to trick him uh, and asked him some questions about, about God and about political leaders and how to relate to them. And in that question, uh, Jesus responded by saying to them, um, show me the money that you use to pay your taxes. And when they showed him the money, he said, whose picture is on that? And they said, the picture of the emperor. So he said, well, give to the emperor the things that, they're, that are the emperor's. So he said, basically, if the money has the emperor's picture on it, it must be his, give it to him. But then he said, give to God what belongs to God. And Jesus did a neat thing there by saying, if, if you've got the emperor and his money has a picture on it, then give the thing with the picture on it to the person. So give the emperor the money because that belongs to him. But he said, then give to God what belongs to God. And so we've got God, but what, what has a picture of God on it? Does anything have a picture of God on it? And I was looking in the Bible again and saying, oh, there's only one thing in the Bible that says that has a picture of God on it that's created in God's image. And that's us, male and female and young and old and uh, all different kinds of people, the diversity that is the whole human race. In the book of Genesis, we're told that we're all created in God's image. And so that's a gift given to us from God. And so we give to God what belongs to God. And Jesus was saying that's our whole being, everything that we are. And so we do belong to God. Let's have a prayer together. Dear God, thank you for today. Thank you for our time together. We thank you that you created us and you made us like you. Help us to remember that. In Jesus' name, amen. Go now in peace. Our scripture readings this morning are Psalm 99 and Matthew 21, verses 15 to 22. And we're happy to have Herb lead us in those readings. Psalm 99. The Lord is king. Let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim. Let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted over all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he. Mighty king, lover of justice, you have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Extol the Lord our God. Worship at his footstool. Holy is he. Moses and Aaron were among his priests. Samuel also was among those who called on his name. They cried to the Lord and he answered them. He spoke to them in the pillar of cloud. They kept his decrees and the statues that he gave them. O Lord our God, you answered them. You were a forgiving God to them, but an avenger of their wrongdoings. Extol the Lord our God and worship at his holy mountain, for the Lord our God is holy. Matthew chapter 22, verses 15 to 22. Then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap him in what he said. So they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with truth, and show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, 
Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And then he said to them, Whose head is this, and whose title? They answered, The emperor's. Then he said to them, Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, and they left him and went away. May God add his blessing to these readings. Let's join together in our next hymn, Lord of Light, Whose Name and Splendor, number 769. Let's come before God in prayer. Let us pray. Lord God, we know that you refuse to be limited by our imaginations. You refuse to be put into a box to make our lives simple. You refuse to stay confined to this one day of the week, to this hour. And for that, we give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, I love to sort and organize things, and I don't think I'm alone in enjoying doing that. We like things to be nice and neat. Whenever I go to my garage to do something, to, to do some sort of project out there, I usually end up beginning by tidying up the garage, putting all the tools back on the pegboard exactly where they belong. I haven't gone as far as outlining every single tool on the pegboard to know where they go, but but I like them to be where, where I want them to be. Or I put them away in my tool chest. It's amazing to see all the things you can buy now 
to organize your garage, to organize your space. There are the usual things like shelves and, and racks for hanging up a shovel or hanging up rakes and things like that. But I've also seen some garages with built-in stainless steel cupboards, uppers and lowers, nicer than I've seen in many kitchens and certainly would rival most kitchens. Maybe I'll preach on coveting sometime in a, a week, sometime soon. But how about planning to do a kitchen renovation? Have you ever done that? It's amazing all the cool things you can find for organizing your kitchen. Drawer organizers, shelf organizers, special kinds of shelves, drawers you pull out for putting your recycling and your compost in, containers for absolutely everything. I think as people we like to be able to sort. We like to be able to organize things. We like to make things feel more manageable. And then we put things where they belong. There's a sense of satisfaction when it feels like everything is in its place. I've noticed recently, too, that as things seem less organized in our world, more chaotic in our world, more uncertain in our world, I've had more of a desire to sort and organize my stuff. I think we do like to organize our lives the same way. It's not limited to our kitchens, it's not limited to our garage and to our things work life, home life, church life, social life. We like to keep these in separate boxes quite often. Have you ever had to tr tried to have a party and mixed a whole group of people together, different people from different backgrounds, from different parts of your life, your work people with your family, your work people, your church people with, with others? Well, how about then inviting your minister to your next office party whenever we might have office parties again. We like to compartmentalize things, a place for everything and everything in its place. You may now be wondering what this might have to do with our scripture readings, the ones that Herb read for us just a few moments ago. Well, let's look at our gospel reading for this morning. Our gospel passage this morning begins with saying that the Pharisees were plotting to entrap Jesus with what he had been saying. The Pharisees sent some of their disciples along with Herodians to see Jesus. Herodians? Who are the Herodians? Well, apparently they were Jewish people who were also supporters of Herod Antipas. And Herod was named King of the Jews by Caesar. So they supported the Roman Empire. So this is an odd grouping of people. Herodians and Pharisees would not generally have a lot in common. The Pharisees would have been against the Roman tax for religious reasons in particular, as well as for practical reasons, but they would go along with it for pragmatic reasons. You can't fight Rome. The Herodians would support the tax because they were also supporters of Herod Antipas. And then there were the common people, especially the Jewish people, knowing their tax went to support the army that was occupying their land as well as propping up the whole Roman Empire. Their taxes were being used for that, so they would not be in favor of a Roman tax. And at this point in our gospel reading, in our gospel, the gospel according to Matthew, Jesus has already entered Jerusalem. He's thrown the money changers out of the temple. He's had a great show of power and religious fervor, and he's begun to cause an uproar in the city. Jesus was causing political problems. A dangerous time, Passover, in Jerusalem. There were so many people, it was making the Herodians nervous. Jesus is also gaining quite a following among his Jewish believers, his Jewish friends and family, and that was making the Pharisees nervous. This passage in Matthew is not Jesus' first run-in as well with the Pharisees. So Jesus is on his guard, and the Pharisees are trying to catch him. So the Pharisees, the Herodians... The religious leaders and supporters of Rome come to Jesus, trying to trap him with a religious and political question. After some insincere flattery, they pose their question. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not, they ask. It's a fairly well laid out trap, actually. And of course, it's asked in front of a whole crowd of people. Apparently the phrase could also be translated as, does the Torah, does our holy teaching, allow us to pay taxes to the emperor or not? And so clearly it is religion and politics. It was a big question at the time for the Jews. 
because it wasn't as though the emperor was a democratically elected official. It wasn't as though you could vote him out at the next election if you didn't like his policies. The emperor was considered divine, at least by the emperor, and he was expected to be worshipped by his subjects. What can Jesus say then about this question, about paying taxes? It looks like it's an either-or question. Either pay taxes in keeping, either paying taxes is in keeping with Jewish law, or it's not. And if it's not lawful, then the Jewish law is in conflict with the Roman law. So if Jesus says, no, it's not lawful to pay taxes to the emperor, he would be aligning himself with a group of extremists who were advocating withholding taxes, armed resistance against the Roman authorities, and being ready to fight for Jewish independence. But if Jesus says, yes, it's lawful to pay taxes to the emperor, he would be seen as caving in to the oppressor, maybe even lose the support of some of his followers who were heavily burdened by the unfair taxes that they had to pay. At the same time, he would be seen as supporting the notion that the emperor was to be worshipped as a god. It is a question in Jesus' day in particular that reaches into those spheres of religion and politics. It appears to be a no-win situation both politically and religiously, and yet somehow Jesus manages to get out of it. First of all, he doesn't mince words. He acknowledges that what the Pharisees and the Herodians are trying to do is trap him, not simply ask him an innocent question or something for intellectual interest. Jesus confronts them and also does it in front of the crowd, as they had done. Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Then he goes on to make his point, which is much more far-reaching than the original question that they had asked. He asked to be shown a coin, the coin that was used for paying the taxes. Show me the coin used for the tax, he said, and they brought him a denarius. Often people have wondered, why would they have a denarius handy? If they were so opposed to this tax, if they were so opposed to carrying anything that had an image of the emperor. He said to them, whose head is on this? Whose title? And they answered, the emperor's. And he said to them, then give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's. It's a brilliant answer from Jesus for many reasons, both politically and religiously. Jesus has taken the either or question and given it a both and answer. First of all, he doesn't tell them not to pay their taxes, but instead puts the whole idea of money and taxes into into a bigger picture. Jesus almost dismisses the importance of the taxes and and money altogether. It's almost though he's saying, give all the money to Caesar for all I care. There's something that's much more important to God. What is that thing that is much more important to God, though? Well, there's a little bit about Jewish storytelling. Jewish storytellers love parallelism. They love different parts of the stories to match up exactly. And in that matching up, is where you find the meaning in the story. And especially if you find a part of the story where something's missing. What's missing is often the important part of the story. That parallelism, Jesus uses it in his answer. The comparison is, made, is being made between God and the emperor. So we have the emperor on one side, and we have the coins stamped in the emperor's image. That's on that side. Jesus says, since the coins are stamped with the emperor's image, then give them to the emperor. They must belong to him. Well, then what do we have as the parallel in the statement? We have God, but we don't have a parallel. The Jewish coins would not have any image of God. They would not have any images of God. In fact, they had no images at all on their coins. They're not stamped in God's image. So Jesus is not saying give the Jewish coins to God, and give the Roman coins to the emperor, that that doesn't fit. He was also not talking about the tithe, the ancient practice of giving the first fruits of the harvest, the first 10% of what we get to God in thanksgiving. No, the parallel is not taxes to Rome and tithe to God. The parallel is much more reaching than that. We have the Roman emperor, and the coins stamped in the Roman emperor's image. Then we have God, but what is stamped in God's image? Nothing is allowed to have God's image. Nothing was allowed to be made 
as an image, as a representation of God. But somehow the phrase seems to stick in our ears. Something sounds familiar, created in God's image. It's, it's from the book of Genesis, right in the beginning, in that beginning of our book. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, God created them. It's strictly forbidden to make an image of God. And yet when God created us, we are told that God created us male and female in God's own image. Both male and female in God's image. We have the parallel now in our story When Jesus says that since the coins are stamped in the emperor's image, they belong to the emperor, he's saying that we give the things to God that are God's. He's talking about us. We are the things that are stamped in God's image. It's a brilliant response, both politically and religiously. The Herodians, the supporters of the Roman Empire, would have gone away saying, Jesus told us to pay our taxes, so he's politically safe. The Pharisees would have gone away saying themselves, Jesus told us that everything in the world belongs to God. Our very beings belong to God, and that's in keeping with the Torah. So the Pharisees and the Herodians are satisfied, but what about us? What has happened to our nice, neat compartments, our nice, neat boxes for keeping our lives organized? You know, one of the problems, I think, with keeping our lives compartmentalized into our different boxes is that we often try to put God into one of those boxes, to leave God there, not interfering with all of the other boxes. Maybe God and family can go in a box together, or God and family and and some of our volunteer work, but God and work, God and politics? No, it's better to keep God in a separate box where God is safe and we're safe and we can go on the rest of our lives. What Jesus actually said, though, is that God belongs in all of our boxes. Or, or another way of looking at it is that we can't keep all of our boxes separate. All the boxes, all of our lives are inside one big box, and, and that's the God box. I think we would like to compartmentalize our, our lives. It'd be neater. It'd be so much easier to manage. This part of my life is church and what I do on Sunday. This part of my life is my own. This is politics. This is other things. And and they don't match. They don't mix. They don't influence each other. What I do during the week, what I do about politics, what I talk to other people about, what I do with my money, that's my own business. And religious beliefs don't need to tie up those. Jesus was saying everything belongs to God, our very selves included. It is in God that we live and move and have our very being, as the Apostle Paul told us. Everything we do and say, every decision we make, every financial decision, every family decision, every hobby and life decision, it's expression of and an extension of our faith in God. What Jesus was telling the Pharisees and the Herodians, and I think he's telling us as well, is that we cannot put God in a box and set him aside from our lives. God does not live here in our church. There are not just little bits of our lives that belong to God. It all belongs to God. Everything we do and everything we say is influenced by our understanding of Jesus' teachings and who we are as God's children and created in God's image, stamped with God's likeness. And Jesus said, give therefore to the emperor the things that are emperors, and to God the things that are God's. And by the way, everything belongs to God. Thanks be to the Almighty, in whom we live and move and have our very being, each and every day. Amen. Let's come before God in prayer. Let us pray. God of majesty, your glory fills the earth and the heavens. You are found in places that we do not expect to find you. You speak to us in ways that are so ordinary that we often fail to hear you. And you reveal yourself in things that are so wonderful that we often fail to grasp that you are behind them and in them. 
Lord, we pray that you may help us to see you and to hear you this day and every day. We gather in the comfort and the warmth of our homes, partly aware of some of the conflicts that are going on around the world, but totally unaware of many others. We pray today in particular for the people of Armenia and Azerbaijan in the midst of conflict. We pray for peace. We pray for the people of Belarus. We pray for the people of Cambodia with flooding. We pray for so many other places in our world touched by violence and intolerance and the disaster of war. Bring your comfort, O oh God, and bring peace. Hear now our prayers as well for our world and for the nations that fill it. For those who hunger and thirst for bread and water, bread and water that you've given to us in such great abundance. For the justice and the mercy that you have wanted for all to experience. For the peace and the wholeness that you want all to know. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for political leaders. Fill them with your wisdom and with compassion and with humility to work together to lead the nations of this world. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for those close to us recovering from surgery or from medical treatments and from COVID-19. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for those who struggle with anxiety, with depression, with mental health issues. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for those who continue to mourn the death of loved ones. Lord, hear our prayer. In silence now, we pray for the needs of those that we are aware of, those in our families, in our communities, and in our world. Those who are in need, and we bring to you our prayers in silence because sometimes the words are wrapped in tears. Sometimes we don't know what words to use or what to pray for, and so in silence, we bring you the deepest longings of our hearts. And so in silence, O oh God, hear our prayers. hear our prayers. Amen. Let's join together in our closing hymn to Abraham and Sarah, number 478.
As we go from this place in the world that surrounds us, we go knowing that we are created in God's image, that we are God's children, we belong to him. Now may the grace, mercy, and peace of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest remain and abide with us this day and every day. Go now in peace. Amen.